Today I'm going to be presenting on research that took me a number of years to do for my dissertation. I could have taken the easy route and selected a topic that a faculty member was interested in, but why do it in the easy way when you could do it the hard way? <laughs> um, so although it took me much longer, I have to say there are many benefits to doing something that you really love. And I'm so glad that I managed to finish, and I have a ton of information to publish on now. Um, I want to first start off by um, uh, saying uh, a saying in French that we often use in my family, l'homme propose, Dieu dispose. And it means man plans, God puts in place. And we often use this expression in my family when we're talking about why things don't work out. Oh, you know what, although we really tried, this didn't work out. Oh, look at all that she did and this didn't work out. Well, sometimes it works the other way around. And I know that everybody who's gone through a PhD, especially the dissertation, they, they feel that they had to have gotten, gotten some kind of help from up above. Because it seems sometimes that all odds are against you. Yes. Yes, thank you. It seems like all odds are against you, and somehow you managed to do it. Um, I'd also like to thank the, um, the committee that uh, selected my presentation. I'm very grateful. Thank you. OK, my presentation was actually on a number of things. I wanted to look at the relationship, first of all, between pride and shame, which are in emotions I was always very interested in, not only in terms of my interest in psychology, but also as an educator. Because I noticed that throughout my career that there'd be many kids who are very bright, but they don't try hard enough. They're easily discouraged by failure. Versus other kids who may not be as bright, but they just seem so much more resilient. And I was wondering if there wouldn't be a connection between that and um, a child's background, the, the quality of his or her relationship uh, with uh, primary caretakers in the family. And then while I was at it, I thought, why don't I just throw in some language development in there? <laughs> and um, later on, you'll see why I was wondering whether all of these relationships aren't somehow influenced by gender. Okay, so before I really start talking about my study, I have to go through a lot of preliminaries with you. Um, otherwise, my study won't make any sense. Um, I, I imagine that there are some people here who know a lot about attachment security and some people who don't. So I, I, have to, I, I had to craft the presentation in such a way that everyone could understand. So um, before I get talk about pride and shame, I'm going to talk about some emotions that come before pride and shame, and we call them primary emotions. We see them in the beginning of life, the first year, um, happiness, um, discomfort, disgust, interest, sadness. But then later on, and um, we have self-conscious <coughs> emotions. And they emerge when children come to realize that they are separate and distinct from others. And the litmus test for that is what we call the Mirror Rouge experiment, developed by Gallup. And basically, before a child uh, recognizes that he's separate and distinct from others, that he has an actual self that belongs to him and him alone, you put the rouge on his face, and he's just happy as can be and will explore in the mirror, no big deal. But then when she realizes, when she has um, gotten to the point where she's, she recognizes herself as separate and distinct from others due to the cognitive, growing cognitive abilities that uh, she's developing, she will notice the rouge on her face. And she's like, oh, wait a minute, what's wrong there? That's the kind of the reaction. And so that develops around 15 to 24 months. And um, it also is accompanied by 
the uh, self-referential, uh, well, the secondary emotions, I'm sorry. Secondary emotions, we have two types, self-referential, which I was just describing the litmus test for, and some of these other emotions are embarrassment, empathy, and envy. Now, self-evaluative emotions, which is what I was interested in, this has to do with pride and shame, that develops a little bit later because it requires some additional cognitive capacities in terms of a better understanding of outside standards. So, um, yes, so uh, the child, given his growing cognitive abilities, he becomes more and more aware of standards, be they externally, uh, uh, um, uh, external to him or internal, because children also come up with their own standards um, that help them to appraise their behavior. Now, besides pride and shame, there's also a mild form, a milder form of shame that comes in the form of embarrassment. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more later. Um, so there's a difference between um, shame, it's not so much pride, but shame when you see it in the socio-moral context, that's like when the kid breaks a vase, versus in achievement context when he completes a difficult puzzle. There's a difference of when these develop. And um, the socio-moral type occurs around the same time as the self-referential uh, um, awareness uh, comes about, uh, but the um, achievement part comes later. Um, and for pride, that usually emerges in terms of self-evaluative pride, that usually emerges at around 30 months. And shame comes around 36 to 42 months. And the intensity of the pride or the shame is also very much linked to the difficulty of the task. If the task is very difficult and the child um, managed to um, get it right, uh, achieve it, then he's likely to show more pride. Or if the task is simple and the child can't understand why you know, he's not doing it, he's more likely to show more shame. Now, um, I talked already a little bit about the onset of the emotions when they come about in terms of age. And the most salient characteristics of both pride and shame are the posture, and this was one of my subjects, drishti. Um, so you, you, drishti is very proud right now, and you can tell because she has a very open posture. She's got a big smile. Her eyes, she's looking directly at me. Uh, and her hands, you know, are also open. Sometimes you see the pride uh, with the hands. The child points to his trophy, whatever he accomplished. Okay, so now that's the part about self-evaluative emotions. Those are the basics. Now I'm going to go through attachment. And that's, that's gonna be quite a few slides. But I put in a lot of pictures to try to make it interesting and not so boring. Now there is uh, Mary Ainsworth, who is um, one of the pioneers in attachment research. She worked under the father of attachment research, John Bowlby. She, um, in a, uh, in a 19, uh, let me see, 1989 publication, she talked about attachment as an affectional and long enduring bond where the partner is, a, is important and unique and that that partner is interchangeable with no other, none other. Which is correct, but this refers more to the collateral products of attachment after time. Because attachment primarily is a survival mechanism. It's a safety regulating system that becomes activated when the child feels needy or that he or she is in danger, feels discomfort, 
feels afraid, and it has an evolutionary purpose. Now, some of the attachment behaviors, um, ones that rel uh, um, this this uh, is signaling the uh, caretaker that, oh, I'm in need. That's crying, going to cling. Look, this one, he's rubbing his eyes, he's sleepy, getting very, yeah. Look, this one, she's already asleep and she's still holding on to mommy. And here, the arms, that's like really very classic uh, picture of what goes on um, when the child is going for the caretaker. All right, and also this, um, and these behaviors have to do with maintaining proximity to the primary caretaker. And then when the child can walk or crawl, um, the child will also express his needs through locomotion and um, to get, you know, proximity to the caretaker. Now this is not, um, this is not unique to human beings. We find this throughout the animal kingdom. And actually, John Bowlby was very much influenced by the work of ethnologists Lorenz and Tintenberg, I mean, Tinberg Bergen. And as you can see, and you know, that animals, uh, baby animals, they stay close to their caretakers. We see that throughout the animal kin kingdom. Now, in a critical period, just about anybody can become somebody's primary caretaker. Here is Conrad Lorenz. And you notice that the ducks are following him because as soon as they were born, the mother was removed and he acted as their caretaker. And ducks, when they, you know, when they're born, the first, they follow the first person that they see. So yeah, they followed Conrad Lorenz and they stayed close with him till the end of their lives, throughout their lives. Um, now, some other interesting experiments on attachment in animals were conducted by Harlow, and he showed that attachment is not just about food. It's, there's something about the comfort of contact that's involved in attachment. Here in this experiment, this monkey, he, um, there, there were two monkeys, two fake monkeys, one wire mother who just provided milk, and then there was another mother, fake mother, that was made of terry cloth and it was soft. So the monkey that was reared by these, uh, these figures, he spent most of his time here with the soft, whoops, uh-oh, I missed my place. Okay, yes. He spent most of his time with the terry cloth fake mom. And even when he's eating, you see, he's trying to keep with the terry cloth mom and try to eat on the other side. He's not letting go. Mary Ainsworth was influenced by these experiments and it gave her an idea to um, create a, a, an experimental uh, I, I, you know what, I'm going to have to put off on Mary Ainsworth for a moment because I, uh, I, I, that's not for another three or four slides. Excuse me, let me get some water. I'm having a Marco Rubio oh, moment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to look at you awkwardly while I'm minutes. doing it either. Okay. <clears throat> Now, there are several basic hypotheses in attachment theory. Um, one, that attachment is universal. Secondly, that it's normative, that most children become attached. And there's quite a lot of evidence for that, only in extreme um, cases of severe abuse and neglect that you do not see um, attachment. But um, apart from that, for the most part, most children do become attached. And also the quality of attachment is determined by the, the sensitivity that the um, caretaker shows to the child. Is, this, is the caretaker reliably accessible, responsive, 
and sensitive to the child's needs. Because you can be accessible and responsive, but how about, are you sufficiently sensitive to know what the child actually needs? Okay, another hypothesis, um, this is the last one, and this is the one that I'm most interested in, especially as an educator, is the competence uh, hypothesis that um, states that attachment, the quality of your attachment, whether it's secure or insecure, predicts your behavior outside the strange situation. And that securely attached children are more likely to be self-expressive, mature, confident in their relationships. They're going to be better to, in tackling tasks than insecure children because when, the, when, you, when uh, you have insecurities, you lose a lot of energy to um, fuel your anxieties. But the securely attached child is less anxiety ridden, so he can invest more energy into his relationships and into tackling tasks. Um, now, there's been quite a lot of research on uh, attachment and how uh, the beneficial effects of attachment. I'm not going to go into a lot of it, but overall, we tend to find that uh, there is a positive relationship between secure attachment and um, better um, uh, results, uh, language-wise, academically, socially. And one thing, um, there are some researchers who were very critical in my thinking and really helped me to make sense of my results also. Um, Morissette et al. They talked about, um, they gave an explanation as to why certain studies didn't, don't find uh, 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 um, expected relationships between attachment security and whatever else that they're, uh, they're testing. It's because attachment security is not something, you do not see the benefits of attachment security any old time. It's not under mundane conditions that we see the beneficial and buffering effects of security attachment. It's under stressful situations that we see it. And sure enough, um, although I did not predict it and I didn't um, conceptualize it while I was doing this study, my, my results uh, ended up supporting this as well. Um, Oh yeah, I just talked about that. Okay, now the classic way to measure attachment security is with the strange situation. And it's done with uh, children at the height of attachment, they call it the 15 to 18 month range, usually in around the period. And they put the child in a room with his mom and then later on a strange woman comes in. There are a lot of episodes to it, but basically there's a lot of going in and out between the mom and the stranger, and uh, the researchers are coding. But the key thing um, that they note in terms of determining the attachment uh, uh, classification is the child's behavior at the moment of reunion. Does the child go and seek the mother's proximity? Or does the child avoid the mother? And um, here are some of the uh, here are some of the typical things that we see um, in the secure child. Originally, there were three categories: um, one secure and two insecure. Later research, there was a fourth category identified, um, and that's in the next slide. But now, securely attached children, they use, in, in the strange situation, they use the mother as a secure base. That means they explore, um, and they, you know, basically often look over, make sure she's still around. They communicate with her through distal eye contact. They may also interact with her. The interaction is more um, meaningful, more rich. Um, they um, have, a, of course, a clear preference to the mother and the stranger. They, they will show distress when the mother leaves. Um, and when she does come back, 
they're easily soothed and can go back to playing and exploring the environment. There is some difference with the insecure avoidant type. Um, the, though they uh, do play and they show a lot of exploratory behavior, they don't interact as much with the mother. And um, they show little to no distress when she leaves. Although this is really a facade because they've done experiments where they measured cortisol levels before the mother leaves and after, and the cortisol levels shoot up, that's the, the stress hormone, after the mother leaves. It's just that the child has learned to suppress his emotions that early. Um, then um, they also react to, similarly to the stranger. And when the mother returns, uh, they avoid, they kind of avoid her. They might take time to reestablish contact. And when they establish contact, there's like something missing. Um, there is uh, a reticence there. Now the insecure, where, where the avoidant type suppressed emotion and um, you know was not comfortable with the closeness, the insecure ambivalent type, they're the opposite. These are very clingy, and because they cling so much to the mother, they do the least amount of exploring in the strange situation. They show the greatest distress when she leaves. It's high drama with this type, very high drama. And when the mother returns, they seem inconsolable. There's just really nothing that she can do. They, um, they, they just, they, they can also become very angry and violent. Now, um, the fourth, there's a fourth category that was um, identified by um, Mary Main, and it's called the disorganized. Uh, it's the disorganized um, category, and this is the saddest one to see because um, here. This is the, 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 the security type that is the least, has the least security. Um, it's usually a, well, it's not usually. This happens to children who have been exposed to extremely abusive um, and, and neglectful behavior, okay? And um, I'm going to show you a chart that explains why these children are very conflicted when you see them in this strange situation. And also, just in general life, they're very conflicted between approach and avoidance, approach and avoidance. And then they can often you know, um, emit these strange postures and freezing because the figure that they most count on uh, for their safety is also the same figure that is most um, harmful to them, the, the figure they, they are the most afraid of. All right, I'm going to go back here because I didn't talk about the parenting that is um, associated with each of these types, with secure attachment. I think we talked a little bit. Um, we said that uh, parents who are, you know, who, who they will, children who, who have, who, who exhibit the secure uh, uh, a pattern. They generally have parents who are accessible, sensitive to their needs, and responsive to their needs. Now, the avoidant type, the mom could be reliable. She's there to take care of the basic physical needs. But emotionally, she's very rejecting and critical. Um, and, you know, maybe even seem aloof to the child. So the child learns that to stay close to this kind of mom or this kind of caretaker, it's better to just retreat. Don't be so noticeable. Because although the insecure avoidant is not ideal, it's still adaptive. The children are, they are developing in this way because they're being trained to develop in this way. Um, and it's for survival. There are, you know, some some conditions, I would imagine some environmental conditions, some societies where, you know, you don't want a child that's too clingy. 
Okay, and then the insecure, ambivalent, the mother can often be warm and sensitive, but she's inconsistent. So she's warm today, cold tomorrow. Um, she feeds you regularly today, tomorrow, she, the next day, you know, it, there's no schedule. So inconsistency is the hallmark of the parenting and the, for the ambivalent type. Now, you could easily understand the attachment when you think about it in this wheel. Um, here you have security, and there's not a, a perfectly secure child. There's a secure child, we call them the B babies. There's the, the B baby that has avoidant tendencies. That's the B1 and the B2s, B3s are the, be, the securely attached children that have some um, uh, ambivalent or resistant tendencies. Here we have avoidant, slightly avoidant with secure tendencies, and then it gets, excuse me, more and more avoidant. And then here you have slightly resistant, more and more resistant, and then, and again, remember resistant is the clinginess, avoidance is the staying away, so the disorganized, disorganized style is between these two. That's why you have the approach avoidance always going on and the disorganized quality to the behavior. We already talked a little bit about which type is adaptive. They're all adaptive except the D uh, category. That's, that's really very um, maladaptive. And, and, and children who have this attachment classification show the most psychopathology, the most maladaptive behaviors. Okay, long-term effects of attachment. Well, when babies, they're learning about what the world is like when they, they, the, their caretakers respond reliably to their needs. They say, well, you know what? My future is going to be okay because when I have needs, other people come and take care of them, or my mom will take care of it. Um, versus uh, an avoidant child says, well, when I have needs, maybe someone is not going to help me. This contributes to the child's overall um, sense of worth. Am I worthy? Is, is there someone always there to reliably to take care of me? Am I worthy of that or not? Okay, so um, let's see. Now, I think this is, uh, we're just about done now with the attachment piece. Now, Jude Cassidy <coughs> talked about some general um, emotion regulation uh, uh, qualities to attachment security. Now I'm going to ask you, um, which type would you say expresses emotions openly and flexibly? Secure, avoided, ambivalent, or disorganized? Yes. Secure? Yes, that's right. So they are more likely to express their feelings and to do it in appropriate ways and to be flexible about the expression of their emotions from context to context. However, let's say about the avoidant, the avoidant type. Which one do you think, um, well, the avoidant, they minimize their emotions. And then the ambivalent, they exaggerate their emotions. All right, I guess you're laughing, you must know somebody. You must know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so I, I found this very helpful in thinking about, you know, hypotheses to make for my study. Um, because uh, now I could say, all right, well, um, this type of child tends to exaggerate emotions, so maybe I might see more pride from the ambivalent resistant type. Maybe I might see more shame from the avoidant type. So this helped me to think about um, pride and shame. Now here are some empirical studies. I'm not gonna go over them one by one, although I'm sure you would want me to. <laughs> but I really had to zero in 
on the literature that I really needed. So there's a lot about pride and shame, well, some. Uh, but uh, I wanted to really see uh, what was out there in the literature in terms of pride and shame for preschoolers. Um, what could I learn from the literature about these, what's going on in the nascent stages of, of, of um, pride and shame, the development of pride and shame in young children? Also, there's a very famous um, researcher, um, Gepper, excuse me, I have to get some more water. <laughs> Um, Gepper <clears throat> has found through his experiments, he's done a lot of experiments on pride and shame in young children and older children too. He's found that children at the age of four and um, five, they start to learn how to mask their emotions, particularly self-evaluative emotions. So that's why I really wanted to, that's why I did it on three-year-olds. I wanted to see what, what are their tendencies like before they're able to mask these emotions. All right, so <clears throat> overall, some of the things that I learned, overall, the, what, what I learned from this literature is that um, critical parental feedback, just about across all the studies, having a very harsh parent who criticizes you, <laughs> this has negative effects on um, the child's um, capacity to express pride. Children who are exposed to this, they express less pride, they have more anxiety, they show more shame. Um, another thing is that results vary in terms of positive parental feedback. Some studies show that there was a positive effect to getting feedback that was favorable, and some studies showed little to no effect. And I was thinking that probably um, attachment security had something to do with that. And then also results vary on gender differences. Um, that was very interesting to me. And I uh, also was thinking that was probably related to attachment security, that this is a man's world. Somehow little girls come to understand that very, at a very young age. And um, they, they may be a little bit more vulnerable to insecure attachment than boys. So basically my hypotheses as it related to self-evaluative emotions and attachment, that they are related, that there's a positive relationship between security and a child's tendency to predict that he or she will do well. Um, there's also a positive relationship between security and expressions of pride. I was predicting that securely attached children will show more of a tendency to express pride and, and the inverse for insecure children, and I was wrong about that. And yes, and, and it had to do with the, um, that idea that it owned that the benefits of secure attachment only come out under stressful conditions. And that's exactly, that was one of the things that I found in this study. And that also that there's a negative relationship between security and expressions of shame. Um, all right. Uh, lastly, um, that girls are more prone to insecure attachment. Later on, I did, I mean, prone to the negative effects of um, secure, insecure attachment when it comes to self-evaluative emotions. Yeah, and I did find that too. Okay, um, now, just as a side, I, I did look at the, you know, I think I told you that I did look at language development and self-evaluative emotions. I'm not gonna spend much time on that. I also looked at um, language development and attachment security. I didn't get all the results I wanted to, so. But anyway, all right, so now let's go on to my sample. I uh, was recruiting 36 to 45 month old children. That's three years, zero months to three years, six months that speak English fluently. I was accepting bilingual children 
but only if they had age appropriate skills in English and that they had to be typically developing. Um, that means having no major delay in any um, of the major developmental areas. Now, I recruited a total of 40 from New York City and Charlotte, North Carolina, wherever I could get subjects. It's very hard. And um, they were, there were six that were disqualified due to uh, below average scores. Um, and, or parents had changed their minds about participating in the study. So I ended up with 34 typically developing children um, and they were um, altogether 16 boys, 18, uh, 18, I mean 16 girls, 18 boys. They were very, uh, very mixed sample racially. About half were white, 25% um, African American, and the balance was between biracial and Asian. The overwhelming majority of them were um, in homes where parents were married, were living together. It was the parents were also very well educated, both moms and dads. Um, all moms had at least an associate's degree and over 65% had a bachelor's degree. Dads, all fathers had at least a high school diploma and all, over 50% of them had um, a bachelor's degree or higher. Now, um, the only easy thing that I did was give a parent survey on background information. Everything else was very time consuming. Um, I administered a full-blown language test, the test for early language development, third edition. It's a norm reference test, and um, it uh, measures receptive and expressive language abilities. Also gives a global language scores, a score that merges the two. Um, I also used a uh, procedure to measure pride and shame that is associated with a coding system for coding for self evaluative emotions. Um, and it was um, is used a lot by Geppert in, in Germany, who helped me in, in planning all of this. Um, and it's a ring, ring stacking toy, but all the rings are the same size. And I compete with the child to see who finishes first. And you can only fit one in at a time. I'm going to show you a little video of it. And there are five, there are five uh, trials. The first um, two, the child, I let the child win. <laughs> then the next two, I make the child lose. And then the last trial, I, I let the child win. OK, and so it's videotaped for later coding. Now, the, the SEEK system has very high inter-rater reliability. That means when they developed this instrument um, and they had two coders working separately from one another, there was a very high concordance in, 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 the, um, in how they measured the children. And wherever they had uh, any disagreements had more to do with the duration of the emotion, but not the advent of the emotion. For the advent of the emotion, is a highly reliable instrument. Okay, um, now in addition to the stacking, before they even get to stacking, they have to predict whether they will win or lose. Now, I had to adapt this because something weird was happening that I didn't read about in any of the literature, that some kids, when they lost, I would say, I won, and I'm expecting them to stop, but some kids kept building, and I noticed also that some kids finished completing the tower and would go on to show pride upon finishing their tower, not caring whether they won or lost. Mm -hmm. And after coding everything and realizing that everybody was showing pride upon winning, I said, oh gosh. What's going to happen now? <laughs> I'm not going to have any results. But, I, and, and, but when I you know, looked at the losing, I said, I better go back to the beginning and start coding again. And thank God I did that, because that's where I got all of my results in terms of the connections between self-evaluative emotions and attachment. 
Okay, so here's the diagram of the ring stacking uh, toy. And we're now going to see. Uh, an episode where she's going to show pride. Tell me, who do you think will win, me or you? Me. You? Okay. Let's see what happens. Ready? Set? Go. She's fun. He can play music. No? Uh huh. of shame. Now I had to drop the shame variable in the study because it was just so, it was such a low incidence of shame. I only saw it once or twice, so I had to drop it, unfortunately. Um, but anyway, I want you to see what it looks like, and it's very painful. It's painful to watch. Let's see. Okay, you said you're going to win? Yeah. You see the top okay, action. No, that he's always predicting the so far that he would win the next round. Alright. The last is that go! And I go win. Oh. And I go win. I won. Now you see, he, he doesn't puff up. He's getting smaller and smaller. He's not looking at me. He, Verts my gaze and he's like trying to hide. Wow. You ready to play again? No, not yet. I don't really got sick yet. Wow. Okay, so um, there were two parts to my coding sheet for this uh, for this procedure. The first part, I record whether the child. Um, uh, predicted that he or she would win, or the experimenter would win. Some children told me that both they would win and I would win together. And um, then there are these two trials. I have this crossed out because um, once they lose, you know, uh, it, it was only for the failure condition that I, that I could record whether they continue to build or not. So that's the first part. The second part of the coding sheet I got from Michael Lewis's lab, which is the, uh, it was, it's in New Jersey. It's the, um, oh, can you, I can't read it. It's too small here for me. But anyway, Michael Lewis is a very famous psychologist. He's like a rock star in developmental psychology. And I called the lab and asked if they would train me on, priding, um, on coding pride and shame. And they did. They were very, Margaret Wolin Sullivan, who's also a rock star, she personally trained me on two afternoons in New Jersey. It was very nice. Very nice of them. So I used their coding procedure. And basically, um, you have to check off three of these to, um, you know, for it to qualify for pride, for embarrassment, or shame. Now, I adapted the sheet to have these two extra columns because, again, I was recording behavior that was occurring after failure. I wanted to see if children were doing anything after failure. Okay. <coughs> now, here were the results. I had a second coder take 20% of my tapes, and in terms of um, the child, when children predicted success, we had 100% agreement on that. Um, for the success trial, there was an 86% agreement, which was great. Um, persistence after failure, 
which I was recording. We got 100% uh, agreement on that and 92% on completing the tower after failure and showing pride. So our intervator reliability was very strong for this, this aspect of the experiment. Now, I also used the attachment story completion task, which is a, um, it, it, it's a procedure used with older children to measure attachment security. Um, and it's a doll play procedure. And it has six scenarios, spill juice, hurt knee, monster in the bedroom, departure, parents leave, have to come, come back, and we see what happens at reunion. It was specifically designed for three-year-olds, year this particular coding system that I used, and it was developed by some French researchers in accordance with Bretherton, who's a rock star for the attachment story completion task. He's another rock star. In anyway, um, so there are 65 statements. You, you videotape this procedure, and there are 65 statements that you have to sort, and that helps you. That, that's how you get your scores. Um, now, the, the uh, instrument itself is supposed to also have high intervator reliability. I chose it for that reason, because the one that was originally developed by Bretherton had low intervator reliability for the ambival ambivalent resistant type. And in this, with this instrument, the children do not receive one attachment score. They get a score for everything. They get a security score, a deactivation score, hyperactivation, and disorganized score. And if you think about it, that makes sense because we're all a little bit of everything, right? But uh, except for me, I'm all on the secure side. OK, now security. The general qualities of how a child behaves on this or how he performs is that the child is collaborative and uh, acknowledges um, feelings. Protagonists display a wide range of feelings, both positive and negative. Adults are presented as supportive. The deactivation style, the child is reluctant to engage in play. The stories tend to be poor, conventional, without much feeling. There's not much interaction between the dolls, not much action. Hyperactivation, very different. The child is aroused by the task. There's a lot of drama. Um, they emphasize the negative aspects. And disorganization, it's, it's uh, you know, th there's a lot of uh, violence and destruction. And, uh, I, I have, I don't have any real, um, well, I'm going to let you d d judge because I'm going to show you some clips. Okay, I have Aracel here. She's the one who we used as a, uh, an example for um, the pride. Okay, thank you. As soon as she reached the top, she fell and hurt her knee. Tell me what happens now. And then she got uh-huh. And then she and then she hurt herself again. She's repeating the negative. Mm -hmm. I know somebody else hurt. Mm -hmm. But who gave who gave the um how did the how did the little sister get the band-aid? Yeah, she hurt herself. I know, but how did she get the band-aid? Because she got hurt. She got hurt? But how did she get the band-aid? Did she get it by herself, or did someone give it to her? She got it by herself. She got it by herself? Okay. Yeah, now we can go on to the next one. Now you see how this one is different? We never, the, the problem never gets resolved. The problem keeps reoccurring. Other people get a hurt knee. And then the mommy hurts the little, little girl. Wow. Now, I don't want you to get the impression that she always um, 
Okay, he falls down. Show me how he falls down. Okay, and then what happens? He throws a giant rock. The monster put through a giant rock at him? Yeah. At the little bear, okay. Does anybody come and help the little bear? Yeah. Okay. Show me what happens. Who comes to help the little bear? It's almost like he's frozen. I see a lot of avoidance. I see some disorganized tendencies. He fell down. Monster threw a giant rock at him. Does anybody do anything about the monster? Yeah. Who, who does something about the monster? Batman. Batman does something about them? He falls down. Okay, he falls down. Show me how he falls down. Show. Okay, and then what happens? He falls down. Now, if you can get my PowerPoint up. Is that it? Oh, wonderful. I just have to find my page. Uh-oh, and we have to get it to, okay. Anyway, so you see the difference? So the first one had a lot of secure attachment tendencies. Okay. Oh, what is it? Uh, this one, okay, I got it, thank you. Thank you very much. So the, does anyone have any thoughts about uh, our little subjects? First, well, okay, anyway, I don't make global assessments on them. It's a pretty involved process to code this. First of all, you gotta take notes as much as you can. Then you can't read your notes, so you have to watch again, and you have to rewrite your notes. And while you're rewriting your notes, you're thinking about these are the first ten, uh, nine items out of the 65 that are used to classify the children. So these are just the first nine. So absence of narrative, the child is inhibited, does not engage or refuses to engage in play or narration. The last one was like that, the boy, right? So I would have to determine whether that was true, neutral, or false. So that would definitely go into the true column for him. So I do that for every single one of the 65 items for each child. So I, I, but often I have to rewrite my notes because I can't see. And I had a lab assistant, my son. When he wouldn't let me watch the videos, I would get him to write things up. Poor thing, I field tested the, the procedures on him too. <laughs> so anyway, the way it's done is that I, I talked to you about the, um, the three columns, true, neutral, and false. And then um, you have to put it into three columns. I mean, the true column, to, the one true column turns into three columns. Very true, true, and less true. To um, uh, not true, not false, a little false, false, and very false. And then you have to do a four sort where you have exactly five cards here, eight here, 12 here, 15 here, 12, eight, and five. It's very time consuming for each kid. So here's one sort that I came up with. Excuse me. And you punch it into a, that was the easy part. Punch it into an Excel sheet that one of the developers shared with me, and it came up with the scores for me for each and every one of the dimensions, okay? So I got, also got a second coder for this procedure, and we had very high inter-rate reliability for the security variable, the deactivation variable, which is the, like the avoidant, 
um, high for disorganization, but we did not get high integrated reliability for hyperactivation. <coughs> and not only was it high, it was not significant. I mean, it turns out that that's not unusual. And, you know, I, I, like I told you, the original instrument developed had this problem. I thought if I use another instrument, it would be different. Well, it turned out to be the same. Okay, now we're up to my results. We're moving. Okay, um, in terms of my results, I'd like to highlight that um, the children, all overall, oh no, the, my pointer's not working. Oh, all right, I'm sorry. Um, oh, but I can't move away from the mic. I can't, I don't have my pointer anymore. My pointer's gone. Okay, thank you. Okay, oh, now it's working on this screen, but not working on that screen. I'll, I'll, I'll manage. They, they All right, so. Side to side, you have to go from one side to the other. Just imagine if that screen's right up to the right of your monitor, so you have to just move the mouse up. That's too advanced for me. All right, thank you. <laughs> um, so we have, now where is, okay, there it is. I just want you to notice that the, you, you, the language scores were very high. They were one standard deviation above normal. And I think that that's part of some of the problems that I, well, part of why I uh, ran into some problems here. Um, hyperactivation, there were major differences between boys and girls, well, no. Oh, no, 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 I don't know why, I'm not sure why I, can, I highlighted that right now because I can barely see it. Anyway, total shame, as you can see, was extremely low, 0 0.06 times in the whole, you know, in all the experiments on all the kids, so. Okay, now, how do I move this? Oh, the arrow. Okay, all right, let's change. All right, so again, um, the, uh, the skewness and kurtosis were really off. These some statistical, they were really off for shame, so I, took them out. Now, when we look at the language measure all the way at the top, um, there was a difference in the expressive scores of boys versus girls. Girls, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, girls scored um, higher, significantly higher than boys um, by about eight points. Um, there was also a difference in the hyperactivation and disorganization scores between boys and girls. Um, boys got higher scores. They, they showed more hyperactivation, more disorganized behavior. And I think it's because they watched those action-packed, violent, you know, cartoons, you know? Anyway, the other thing is that boys showed more pride after failing than girls. They, and it was almost significant almost significant. So, um, uh, you know, our prediction about, um, you know, girls showing less pride is coming along here. Now, we're not gonna go through this. I redid this table so you can see things a little bit better. We have um, some, um, I'm here I'm looking at the correlation between the um, pride and, sh uh, the, well, at this point, the pride, because I dropped the shame. The pride variables with language and attachment. Now, predict success that was significant for security uh, and deactivation. Um, so kids that were securely attached tended to predict su success and the opposite for the deactivation variable. Now, you see pride on success trials we have nothing for attachment, no significant relationships for attachment, but we do have it for every one of the language scores. <coughs> so pride upon winning almost has no emotional value in, as it relates to attachment. Um, there's really no connection there, but there is a connection between the child's language development, and I think that's because that's the 
you know, proof that the cognitive abilities that are associated with it, because the kids who did not show pride were also the kids who had the lower language scores. Okay, and then um, in terms of persisting after failure, there's no correlation with language variables. Um, pride after failure, no correlation with language variables, but we do see a correlation with, de uh, with attachment variables. Um, specifically security and deactivation. And they were polar opposites, as you can see. There was always a positive association with security and always almost a mirror image, but in the negative for the deactivation. All right, and then I um, did a procedure where I uh, minus the effects of language and, st and looked at um, pride and um, attachment, and we still maintain more or less just about all of the relationships um, showing the expected negative, uh, positive and negative uh, uh, um, out, um, relationships between attachment and pride. Okay. Oh, no, oh yeah, oh, yeah that one. I redid this one to make it bigger so we can see. All right, so here I wanted to also show you that I, I desegregated the data, boys versus girls, and I looked at how, does, how do boys deactivation and hyperactivation correlate with pride versus how does it correlate with uh, pride for girls. And that was very interesting because as you could see, there was a positive association between persist after failure for girls, I'm sorry, a negative association for girls, but a positive one for boys. Persist after failure and expresses pride, a negative one for girls and a positive one for boys. But yeah, and that was significant, yeah. Then um, also for the hyperactivation score, um, there were polar opposites, but again, th we didn't get high inter-rated reliability on that one, so I don't spend much time. The other thing that I found is that attachment only, and not language, predicts, not a, yeah, predicts um, the child's tendencies, behavioral tendencies in expressing pride, okay? So, and uh, I'm gonna sk uh, skip the, um, the language part. Now to um, wrap up, some of the unexpected findings I'm going to review. It was a high frequency of pride, very low shame. I was, very, I, I was not expecting that. <clears throat> and uh, Margaret Wolin Sullivan in Michael Lewis's lab said that that was not unusual. They've run into that problem as well, especially with smaller samples. Um, <clears throat> another surprise was that the children continued to build the towers um, and thanks to the adaptations in the coding, I was able to get some associations. I was able to find some associations between attachment and self-evaluative emotions. Um, I was really surprised that there was no uh, association between attachment and pride upon winning, but then when um, you remember the um, researchers that say that we see the beneficial effects of attachment under stress, not under happy conditions, then it's not really, um, un, you know, shouldn't really consider it so unexpected. Um, <clears throat> let me see if there's anything. So basically the results, they support attachment theory on uh, theory on uh, the competence hypothesis, um, especially for the secure and deactivation variables. Uh, we did see um, proof of Cassidy's theory on attachment and emotion regulation because the, um, you know, with the positive relationship we saw between attachment um, and security, but negative for deactivation. Um, and, uh, now, the lim study limitations, there was a, s a small sample, so it gave the, you know, it was low power, but I was really absolutely 
thrilled to get the, the significant results. And um, the low incidence of shame, again, probably because of the small sample. Uh, another problem, I think, was the children's language scores. They were one standard deviation above normal, the, the, their mean. So if I think that, I, I believe that if I had a more normally distributed sample in terms of scores, mm -hmm. that it, when it came to my predictions between language development and attachment, I think I might have seen something there. But I think that another um, <clears throat> drawback <clears throat> or um, limitation to the study is that it was very culturally diverse. And um, now, I, different cultures put different value and importance on winning and losing. Um, so in, when I do this again, I would be using more homogeneous groups. Um, and it would also help me to see if specific types of parenting practices, because there are some parenting, some cultures that use a lot more shaming practices than, um, than others. So would we probably find more avoidance there, probably. OK, and let's see. Yeah, I had challenges in rating the boys. I don't know how to go around that problem. Um, since the boys, uh, you know, they, they put so much action-packed stuff in there from the superheroes. Um, now, in terms of implications for education, it really shows us that as educators, um, it's just same as when parents are overly critical and give a lot of critical feedback, that it, it can be, you know, it, it's also deleterious, I think, in the educational setting. Uh, we have to be careful in how we give the feedback. Um, I think that uh, other things uh, that this study supports is that programs and uh, training efforts that support socio-emotional well-being of children for optimal development uh, and, and academic achievement in infancy and toddlerhood. I'm thinking about programs like um, that they have in Canva, a huge um, nonprofit organization in, in, in Brooklyn. I know that they have similar here in Queens, but it's a healthy families and community health worker programs where you, they have workers going into the home and um, talks and trains uh, mothers who are at risk of neglecting their children or um, mistreating them or forming unhealthy attachments um, to really get the mother to appreciate the child's development, all the wonder that's involved in that. Um, programs like Early Head Start and other programs that help foster secure attachment patterns. Um, preschool, again, continue with Head Start. Staff development on possible negative effects of positive praise. Dweck, a very famous psychologist, um, she talks about the negative effects of positive uh, uh, um, feedback, always saying, oh, you're so smart, you're so smart. And you know that the emphasis is on being smart and not hard work. Um, a lot of her research on learned helplessness has shown that it's really important to give positive feedback on effort, not on smarts or talent. Okay, and that's about it. Grade school and high school and beyond. I think that our teachers just basically need more training on how to be more sensitive to the needs of children. Children are acting out. We need to have a better understanding why, not just you know quickly punish and isolate the child. And uh, the other thing is that at the college level, you know. Uh, Students often complain that the teacher had it in for me. The, t the test was hard, or it was not fair, it was not this, it was not that. Um, but we need to learn better strategies on coping with these difficult situations. Because one thing um, is that persisting after failure has a lot of benefits. So don't be discouraged by a little bit of a hard time. Just keep persisting. So that's for parting thoughts. I'll tell you, especially the students, to forget talent, forget inspiration. Habit is more reliable. 
Habit is persistence and practice. So persist, persist, persist. Thank you.